everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so I'll be with you any minute now, catching up with myself. I am really grateful to be here. Uh, growing up in Houston, Texas, the, uh, okay, I'll get used to that. the uh, oil capital of the world and uh, taking action to stop the flow of oil through the Keystone Pipeline several months ago and waiting to stand trial, it's, uh, it tickles me that suddenly I get to be in a pulpit. <laughs> so, thank you. Uh, United Church of Christ, Magnolia, uh, whenever there's a rally, a protest, a march, uh, two faith groups show up, and it's UCC and Unitarians, and your, your doctrine, your organization around climate, and stewardship is leading faith groups around the world. So thank you for your action. Um, I need to begin by saying that where we worship today in this incredible sanctuary, I love it, is Duwamish territory, stolen uh, from people who lived here for thousands of years in ancient, temperate rainforests. And until Europeans like me and you came along and, and <coughs> cut those forests down and, and straightened the rivers and filled in the wetlands and built houses right up to the seashore, uh, they lived of this place. And it was only after we changed their home, their sacred home, that gave them life that they had to figure out how to work for money. So I, that's really kind of the nutshell of my whole sermon today and the scripture that we heard earlier. Um, we are here today to learn how to live of this place or it will no longer allow us to live here. That's the moment that we find ourselves in. So I'm grateful, I'm humbled to be here um, and inviting a, a, a charged felon to your uh, pulpit. I mean, Jesus would be really proud. <laughs> That's all I can say. guy, he's committed some crimes, maybe. He was trying to help, you know, the birds and the lilies, okay. You know, he didn't hurt anybody, so sure, let's hear what he has to say. You know, bring him on. Um, this, this act that we did was, was a Good Samaritan act. Right? And now we have Good Samaritan laws that protect you if you're trying to prevent somebody from dying, you can't be prosecuted, right? Because, you know, your intention is clear. So, um, thank you again for, for having me come here and speak to you about our, our Good Samaritan Act. Um, my simple understanding of our moment is that the reason humans are still here as we eliminate most of creation is to prevent and reverse the suffering that we create in the world. In Laudato Si, the encyclical on care of our common home, Pope Francis, Francis of Assisi, he holds a master's in science, by the way. He's the most influential climate scientist on Earth. Um, he asks, what need does the Earth have of us? That 
can be a hard, cool, cruel, cold question. Like, you know, we need nature, does nature need us? But today, I suggest that nature needs us. Um, the Pope goes on to write, it is no longer enough for us to be concerned with future generations. We need to see that what is at stake is our own dignity. I don't know nothing about dignity. Uh, personally, uh, I, I, I don't know what that word means, really. I do know that I can no longer live with myself, poisoning everyone and everything that I love. That's hard for me. Um, I, I can't poison the tree of life any more than I have already done. I do not believe that God wanted me to uproot most of Earth's species for the next few million years so that I could keep driving around in gas cars and trucks for a couple years more. And that's really our only choice. Do we want to stop driving now or stop driving a few years from now? We don't get to keep driving. Not gas, not oil. So let's ask ourselves, um, before we turn the ignition, light the fuel that eliminates the possibility of most of creation to live beyond our waste, what would Jesus do? Of all the unimaginable cruelty in the history of the living world taken together, there has never been a crime against all of humanity and nature. Not one. Has any tribe or society knowingly, intentionally designed their own home to grow wealthier and accumulate power and leave it uninhabitable for our own children? That's what we do right now. How can I participate in if I have any self-preservation instinct, any love for my own family. I was lucky enough to help pull together a lawsuit uh, where children, a group of kids, are suing the state of Washington for a climate justice plan. Uh, and so far, they're winning. Uh, the first time in US history that Courts ordered, directed a government agency to fix climate. The judge ruled that uh, these children have rights and the government, the state of Washington under our state constitution has an obligation to deliver Washington's essential resources, air and water, which they will require to grow to adulthood safely. I'm, I'm quoting from the judge's ruling here. This is, this is unheard of, right? Kids right here, you are the first on, the, on North America anyway to have your universal human rights to climate justice spelled out in law. And we continue to ignore all of that. And we've been fighting this in court for three years and we're going back in the next few weeks. You and I continue to violate universal human rights to a habitable home with almost everything we do in our daily lives. It's how we feed ourselves and clothe ourselves. It's how we move in the world. So that's the dilemma today. That's the, the thing that I cannot stop wrestling with. How do I feed my kids, protect my family, take care of my home without poisoning it? Everything I do to privilege my kids or give them any advantage is also choking their future, making life untenable.
cannibal. So I devote every waking hour to stopping the greatest existential disaster in the history of life. Will 95% of life disappear? Or only 50%? We decide. You and me, right now. When Jesus said, consider the birds and lilies, he was pointing out the way life has evolved to provide for us when we live in place, in balance, you know, with all the creatures all around us, with appetites met by our home. Today, the survival of birds and lilies and ourselves, all of God's creatures, is critically compromised, possibly beyond repair. Yet we civilized humans, civilized, civic, of the city, cities feeding on, mining, all of creation. We civilized humans. We can imagine no other way to live. Our distance from the place that sustains us is so vast. Our understanding is so limited, so boxed in. We cut ourselves off from our home and from one another to feed our, our tasteless corporate appetite for more, more, more. We have to feed the beast this endless appetite. Love is a thing. Love is a real thing. Uh, every religion, every society on earth understands love is a real thing. Loving your family tree, not discounting the people who come next or three generations or seven generations later. As Jesus says, even the tax collectors do that. Right? That's not hard. It's something that you can't avoid. Right? Loving your enemies may be harder, but how hard is it to love animals? The voiceless creatures who now depend on us to fix this. From the documentary Earthlings, it takes nothing away from a human to show kindness to an animal. John Denver was actually my, my first real spiritual mentor. <laughs> I listened to those albums until they were so scratched and torn up. Um, and so I will not sing for you this morning, <laughs> but I will quote, Oh, I love the life within me. I feel a part of everything I see. And oh, I love the life around me. Part of everything is here in me. How can I not do everything I can to end this crime? Our lifestyle choices kill. So what does it mean to be civilized and human inside a wealthy society? feeds off the bones of the world's poor and voiceless creation that we're killing right now so that we can have our peaceful, civilized, wealthy, powerful, influential, technologically advanced Seattle. That's how we get to be here now. We depend on all of these injustices and inequities. Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And I believe that. Are we meek enough yet to inherit the earth? I don't think that's where our civilization is, is pointing. I think we're pointing towards more power, more accumulation. Jesus said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. When do we mourn in, as a society, as a tribe? I know that when we do, comfort appears. When half of the living vertebrates on the planet have passed since 
I was in first grade. In my lifetime, I have profited. I have benefited from this. How can I not mourn when two-thirds of vertebrate animals of all kinds will have been reduced, the population reduced, by the end of this presidential administration. How can I not act? Every animal you see, there were three of those when I was a kid. Every single one. The solutions are right in front of us, and if poisoning the air and water is now deadly to our children and future generations in nature, then I can no longer participate. If every dollar I earn and spend is soaked in oil and fuels the beast devouring all life to come, I can no longer feed that beast. My soul will not allow me to pull the plug on God's handiwork, our life support. Our children, this generation, depend on us to figure this out fast, immediately, in fact, in order to be able to end their lives on a planet similar to the one on which civilization developed, which we have, and to which life as we know it is adapting. I ask as my heart breaks open and I despair, if I am not for myself, then who am I? If I am only for myself, then what am I? If not now, when? From Rabbi Hillel. I give climate slideshow presentations pretty much everywhere people sit still. And I'm always asked two questions. Number one, is it too late? Number two, what can I do? So the scientists have worked this out, and this is what the children are suing for in their case against the federal government, Washington, and now in countries around the world. Reduce your pollution 10% every year, and restore 10 years worth of pollution back to the soil and the forests. That's about a trillion trees worth of carbon back into the ground. This is physically possible, but you have never heard any economist talking about reducing our pollution 10% a year. Wouldn't that destroy jobs? Wouldn't, wouldn't the economy or the economic model, the GDP, wouldn't that collapse? Life is collapsing. You see how you hear how we're serving money. And it rules us now because we are now more interested in whether the markets go up than whether the population of living things is able to go on. If we don't act now, life crashes, everything crashes. Money ruling our lives stands dead center, blocking the path to freedom and all life to come. So what culture, what religion would knowingly commit their young and everything we love to a certain doom? That's that's, un that's unimaginable. We would never do that, would we? How could we? So as a kid, I struggled with this. You cannot serve two masters, God, and money. I just didn't get it. You know, I mean, how, how could you feed your family? You know, what would you wear? All the questions that Jesus spells out right there in the scripture. Yeah, it, it doesn't make any sense. The Pope in the 
encyclical says, when people become self-centered and self-enclosed, their greed increases. The emptier a person's heart is, the more he or she needs things to buy, own, and consume. It becomes almost impossible to accept the limits of reality. In this horizon, a genuine sense of the common good also disappears. As these attitudes become more widespread, social norms are respected only to the extent that they do not clash with personal needs. You and I are born here with silver spoons in our mouths, choking us and everyone we love and all to come after. But how do you live without money? It's just not, it's not fair, it's a riddle. You know, how, do I, how do I do this? So that's the riddle I am now living. I have reduced my need for money to a couple of hundred bucks a month. And i got to tell you, the less I have in my life, the happier I am. I don't know how many of you have ever seen the old movie Meet John Doe, but there's a hilarious scene in it where the kind of noble bum talks about helots, you know, and how anytime you get a little money in your pocket, you become a target for the helots, and the helots are a lot of heels who want to sell you things, right? And as long as you don't have any money in your pocket, they leave you alone. <laughs> well, I'm living that life now. It's great. I can ignore so many things that I used to worry about all the time. Uh, the Dalai Lama says, when you're discontent, you always want more, more, more. When you Desire can never be satisfied, but when you practice contentment, you can say to yourself, oh yes, I already have everything that I really need. And it's so true, I'm really, I'm working this out now. It's pretty awesome, just don't go into a grocery store with me. Because I can wander the aisles for half an hour and not buy anything. It's actually becoming harder and harder for me to buy things. I can't see a thing without seeing the carbon footprint that it comes with, the plastic it's wrapped in. Let me look at those bananas. Oh my God. The coffee? Don't, don't even think about the coffee. So don't go to the grocery store with me because I'm learning this weird meditation on wanting less, less, less. And it's very satisfying when I've wandered the aisles for half an hour and I walk out empty-handed. And instead of wondering, you know, what did I go in there for? I say, oh, I, I remember why I came out empty-handed. So I do eat vegan now. It's an easy, easy choice in Seattle. Uh, and then Ben and Jerry's <laughs> came out with non-dairy desserts to tempt me. Yes. Um, the carbon profile of those non-dairy desserts is really about equivalent to the ice cream, but, um, but without the cruelty to animals. And again, it takes nothing away from me to be kind to the animals. So I was one of the five people shutting off uh, safety block valves on five tar sands pipelines, all the tar sands coming into the U.S., 2.3 million barrels. For that morning, all that oil stopped moving. 15% of the nation's oil supply stopped. When I turned the valve, 590,000 barrels of poisonous bitumen stopped moving under my feet. And it was a great, great moment. Uh, we used bolt cutters in our hands. We waited for arrests. We're facing trial now. Ken Ward was the first to stand trial. He was sentenced on Friday in Skagit County. His maximum risk was 10 years for burglary. Uh, his first jury was hung. They couldn't decide that he was guilty or not guilty after watching a video of him doing the thing. Um, because 
when Martin Luther King wrote from Birmingham jail, he said, when a person challenges an unjust law and is willing to face the punishment, it arouses the conscience of the community and shows ultimate respect for the law. So the jury couldn't decide if he was guilty. Well, they, they found him guilty on burglary, and the judge sentenced him to 30 days community service. That sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> <laughs> the judge said that in his entire career, and he retires this week, in his entire career, he couldn't recall a case where there was no human avarice involved, no benefit to the individual, no monetary gain, and no addiction, no, no drug crime. Of course, George Bush told us we were addicted to oil. Uh, Ken was trying to help us break that addiction. Um, but there was no, no addiction and no money involved in this act to stop this oil, to prevent the poisoning of our home. So uh, you can hang around afterwards. Um, I see another valve turner in the uh, congregation today. Annette is here, and if you just want to wave. Annette turned off a valve in Minnesota, and we will be happy to answer questions and tell our stories uh, then. Um, what really brought me to shut off that pipeline is a moral and selfish act in service of my very healthy sense of self-preservation. Was growing up near refineries, losing my dad at age three, grandmother to cancer after many years, and understanding that life and death are one, and that we need to carry forward our family tree. And, uh, and growing up, Jesus was my friend. I was a pretty uh, righteous Bible thumper, president of Youth for Christ two years in high school. I preached my first and only sermon at 16. Uh, but a man that I loved and respected came and preached a youth revival in my high school. And he was on TV and riding around in limousines. And he was preaching about these kids, my friends, giving, 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 so that they would receive back tenfold. I couldn't take it anymore. And I sat in the front row. I stood up in the front row and I held my butt and I shook my head. And I was so angry and I didn't know what to say. There weren't any, there weren't any money lenders or any, there weren't any tables to turn over. So I just stood there mute. And the whole auditorium stopped and looked at me. And he said, you know, son, do you need to meet Jesus? No. I said, this is wrong. He couldn't get me to sit down. But after that, I couldn't go into the ministry. I couldn't I didn't hear God's call. And I didn't want to assume that I knew what was God's plan for his ministry better than he did. And I certainly didn't want to turn his ministry into a picture or reduce it to a paycheck. So, I'll wrap it up. We have to be the lilies. We have to be the birds. We really are. We share the same DNA. Most of my DNA is no different from theirs. In fact, if you look at most of my genetic material in my body, most of it is not mine. I have more bacteria living in me than me. They help me eat. I'm just a host here. Right? So, um, what would Jesus do about global warming? What would Jesus do about cruise ships going to Alaska? 
with thousands of people dumping raw sewage into the oceans, spewing 80,000 cars worth of CO2 into the air as they move. What would Jesus do when it was time to take the kids on vacation to Hawaii? Get some snapshots with the coral reefs, which are dying and disappearing. Or at Glacier National Park, where most of the glaciers are gone. In the Lorax, another mentor, <laughs> Dr. Seuss, taught me that unless, unless, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, it's not going to get better. It's not. I can't do this alone. Please don't make me be a hero. We have seven billion people who need to change our hearts in order to let life live. We need to plant a trillion trees. They won't plant themselves fast enough. We've messed things up badly enough that Earth needs you. Amen. And that's what we're here for. As Chief Arful Looking Horse says, you alone and only you can make this crucial choice to walk in honor or dishonor our relatives. On your decision, depends the fate of the entire world. Each of us is put here in this time, in this place, to personally decide the future of humankind. Did you think the Creator would create unnecessary people in a time of such terrible danger? Know that you yourself are essential to this world. Understand both the blessing and the burden of that. You yourself are desperately needed to save the soul of this world. Did you think you were put here for something less? Amen. In a sacred hoop of life, there is no beginning and no ending. 